Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I must say uh, that I'm, I'm very happy to be here, very excited to be here. And I have to thank Rene and Felipe, wherever he is. There he is. <laughs> um, but I thought at first that it would be so great to have the last word today. But after these extraordinary talks, I would like to say, I mean, TED Talks, with so much <laughs> confidence and no script, I'm, I'm kind of intimidated, so I'm, <laughs> I brought my podium <laughs> and my speech with me. But I'm working on making this uh, manifesto. In fact, I've signed the contract. So you can all be my critics around this talk. And I have to say that what I've learned this weekend is going to be folded into this manifesto because it's just opened my mind again. So thank you very much. So to begin, I have come to offer a hopeful scenario, one that faces the problems we've been discussing at this conference head on, but one that shows a way globally food can lead us out of them. We all know that there are grave issues facing our world today. Addiction, environmental degradation, political and economic inequalities, land use, poverty, childhood hunger, and the overarching climate change. But all of these very serious issues, in my opinion, are all the outgrowths of one deeper, more fundamental condition. They're all byproducts of something more insidious, something so deep-rooted, so destructively elemental and pervasive that it provides the soil, if you will, for all the other issues to grow out of. And unless we deal with this deeper, darker, systemic condition, I think that all the other problems will ever really go away. They might get a little better, but they'll always be coming back in one form or another. By not addressing this extensive underlying condition, I feel that we're trying to cure the symptoms of a disease without dealing with the root causes of the disease itself. So what is this deeper, more fundamental condition? The well-known author, Eric Schlosser, has pointed out in the United States that we live in fast food nation. Sad to say, fast food is the dominant way people feed themselves in my country. Surprisingly, people don't know this, or don't want to know this. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible that Eric wrote his book 20 years ago, and people are still so addicted to fast food. For example, in the United States, 20% of all meals are eaten in the car. 85% of our children don't eat one daily meal at the table with their family. And people think that fast food is more affordable than cooking for yourself. So, being the thing people don't want to see, maybe it's a thing that they really don't want to see. And it's something that I've come to clearly understand over the last decade or so, is that fast food isn't only about food. It's bigger than that. 
It's way bigger. It's about culture. And culture is the knowledge, the experience, beliefs, behaviors, myths, and customs of a society. It's the invisible moral structure underneath everything that's guiding us all consciously and subconsciously, and therefore, it's affecting everything we do. Culture defines our points of view. It dictates the way we look at the world, how we operate in it, how we relate to the environment, how we see ourselves, how we express ourselves, how we relate to each other, how we feel, how we do business, the ways that we set up our home, our architecture, our schools, our entertainment, our journalism, how we treat each other, the clothes we wear, our politics, and on and on. Fast food culture has become the dominant culture in the United States. And I fear that it's becoming the dominant culture of the world. And this is happening because fast food culture, like all cultures, has its own set of values, and I call these fast food values. So if you're eating in a fast food restaurant or in fast food manner, not only are you malnourishing yourself, you're unwittingly digesting the values of the fast food culture, and those values are becoming part of you, just like the food. And once those values become part of you, they change you. You begin to have a different outlook on things, different craving, different moral standards, and different expectations. Now your desires and your hungers are being programmed by a fast food culture. And because of that, you start to create a dehumanized world for yourself without ever even knowing it, a world with fast food values inherent in it, a world where fast food values seem appropriate. Uniformity. Ah, uh, that's an example of a fast food value. The idea that everything should be the same wherever you go. The hot dog that you get in New York should be exactly like the one you get in Rio. That feijoada that you get here in Sao Paulo should be just like the one you might get in Hong Kong. The Starbucks macchiato that you can get seemingly everywhere these days should be exactly like the one you get in, is it Seattle or Dubai? And if it's not, there's something wrong with it. We take uniformity for granted. We actually like it a lot. It helps us feel familiar in unfamiliar places. Why, it's just like the hamburger that I can get at home. That taco looks and tastes just the way it does in Mexico City. Uniformity comforts us, and it helps us feel safe, or we think it does. Because uniformity, like all fast food values, hides deeper darker qualities. In terms of what, oops, my apple. <laughs> I can't, it's my security. <laughs> I have to hold on to this apple. <laughs> I, it's from here, too. <laughs> Carry it with me. Suddenly, there's something suspicious about it, something to be rejected, something even to be afraid of. Eventually, you want everything not just food, to look the same, to be the same. You look for the same kind of TV shows wherever you go. You design the same buildings in every city and town. You start wanting the same clothes as everyone else has. And you search for hotels that are familiar wherever you go. Recognizable chains, brand name, outlet stores. Uniformity as a value 
fosters the loss of individuality and regionality, the pressure to conform, the disrespect for uniqueness, even prejudice and control. All eggs should look the same. All houses should look alike. Everyone should behave in a certain way, or you need to report them. Speed. Speed is another fast food value. Things should happen really fast. The faster, the better. You order it, you get it, you want it, you should have it. Right then, no waiting. The faster something's done, the better. In and out. In the United States, Amazon now delivers groceries right to your door as fast as they can get them to you. There are even some companies in the United States who refund your money if you can't get your food at the time you expect it. That's kind of amazing. And when you live like this, I fear that it's not only that not only do your expectations get warped, but we become easily distractible. We lose the sense that things that take time, the best things take time, like growing food or cooking or learning a language or growing a business or getting to know somebody, for that matter. These days, if there's not instant gratification, we get frustrated. There's no maturity, no time for reflection, no patience. The faster it's delivered, the faster it's communicated, the more valuable. Time is money. How many cows can you slaughter in the slaughterhouse in a day? How many patients can a doctor see in an hour? How fast can you eat your lunch? How fast can you download your messages on your cell phone? Ah, uh, availability. There, that's another fast food value. The idea that we should be able to get anything we want, wherever we are, whenever we want it, 24-7. You should be able to get an avocado in the Andes in the middle of winter, and you probably can. Sometimes, sometimes you can even get Avion water in Nairobi, a pineapple in Tierra del Fuego. The twisted idea of availability to me not only spoils people, but causes them to lose track of where they are in time and space. With the constant availability, seasons stop mattering. Why wait for the late summer apples that are grown right down the road when we can get cryovacked ones at the discount store all year long? Suddenly, what's indigenous to certain places becomes unclear, maybe even irrelevant. Local culture and the specialness of what's happening here and now becomes less important than the big, homogenized, get-anything-you-want global reality, or in my view, unreality. Cheapness, ah, this one. This is so omnipresent in the United States. There's a complete mixing up of the idea of affordability and cheapness. There's a deep feeling that value equates bargains. Buy two, get one for free. Four hamburgers for a dollar. Food for less. One of the first things that Jeff Bezos did, the president of Amazon, Amazon, <laughs> interesting in this conference, <laughs> did when he bought, has a whole new feeling for me, did when he bought Whole Foods, the semi-sustainable grocery chain in the United States, was to drop prices. Yes, some customers were benefited by that. But 
What about the people who were growing the food and bringing it to market? Fast food culture makes you conveniently forget about them and also about the environmental costs of farming on a massive scale and the amount of carbon needed for the transportation and refrigeration. With cheapness, nobody understands the real cost of anything anymore. One, because nobody ever tells them. And two, everything is priced artificially, supported by subsidies and corporate sleight of hand and credit. When cheapness has such a high value, no one talks about the quality of things anymore or how good or bad it might be for you or for the planet. It's just what a good deal it is. What a good deal. The truth is, and it's something that we all need to learn, food should be affordable, but it can never be cheap. When I hear somebody say, I got this cheaper over here, I just feel intuitively that somebody, somewhere, is being sold out. You cannot not pay for something over here without someone over there not getting what he deserves or she deserves. And not expect to have other problems in your life over there, such as those we're having with the environment and climate change. Ah, uh, more is better. The more you pile on your plate, the happier you'll be. The more cans on the shelf in the big box discount store, the better. The bigger the buffet, the more awesome. Basically, the more you have, the more choices you're offered, the better. I find this fast food value so strange, because to me, when I get too much stuff, or have too many choices, I get overwhelmed and I feel burdened. There's no room for discernment. There's just weight and volume. And with the volume comes so much waste. In the United States, our garbage bags and landfills keep getting more and more filled with boxes and bubble wrap from things shipped from halfway around the world. There are even storage units now right on the west, the river on the side of New York, storage units in, in what were once huge apartment buildings. And they're just for putting all the stuff that we can't fit in our houses anymore. We have to store them so we can buy more. Fast food, ah, oh, terminology. Where is terminology? There it is. Fast food culture also co-ops the meanings of words in order to make a profit. And I call this a terminology problem. What does organic mean these days? Natural. For that matter, what does local mean? Or fair trade? Or fresh? When things are two or three weeks old and shipped from thousands of miles away. The definitions of these terms have been hijacked, and they seem to fluctuate and have more to do with marketing and presentation than attempts to clarify and inform. And what's scarier is how fast these terms get hijacked. When the food movement finds a new term that works for us, like sustainable, it gets absorbed immediately in the fast food culture, and it's used everywhere indiscriminately. If not, it, the term becomes cloudy and misleading, if not meaningless. Take the words pesticide-free or government-approved. How about pasture-raised? How about pasture-raised? Is it organic when you buy eggs that are pasteurized? What does pasture raised mean? Does that mean, you know, 
three yards out in the field, or does it mean a real pasture? We have no idea. And there are many other slippery terms. And then it comes to standards. Behind the issue of terminology is the issue of standards. What are the standards that we're using, and where did they come from? There seem to be standards, but they don't mean anything. And they shift from one country to another. What's organic for a farmer in China, for example, may not be the same for an organic farmer in California. And so it confuses everyone, defeating the purpose of having standards in the first place. Even worse, some standards reduce standards. As in the case of food companies who lobbied to get fabricated compounds like corn syrup considered natural ingredients in their products. Another standard that's baffling to me is the idea of carbon credits. If you pay for them, you get a free pass, in a sense, to pollute in other countries. What kind of standards are those? They feel like entitlement standards. Tell me, do, do carbon credits really help to save the rainforests in Brazil? <laughs> in many cases, standards are kind of a deception, kind of a lie, another fast food value, dishonesty. Perhaps the biggest fast food value of them all, dishonesty. Actually, I used to think dishonesty was the biggest fast food value of all, and now I think it is greed. Greed. Greed is the value that's causing the most destruction in our world. The impulse to honor profit and financial accumulation over human value and environmental protection. I should not be shocked, but I have to say that I am. I'm shocked by the persistent collusion between corporations and governments and those responsible for protecting and nurturing our precious food supply and natural resources. So, so yes, there is a fast food culture, and yes, it permeates every aspect of our lives. And yes, it is literally changing the world we live in. But fortunately, there's a counterforce. <laughs> and I call it an antidote, and no surprise, slow food culture. And slow food culture has its own set of values. And I call these slow food values. You know these. You know these. Sustainability. Ah, sustainability. Seasonality. Diversity. Economy. Interconnectedness. Interdependency, responsibility, collaboration, authenticity, generosity. By the way, all of these photographs were taken at the Edible Schoolyard Project in Berkeley at Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School. So, so how do we awaken values like this? How do we champion slow food values in a fast food world? How do we rediscover them, cultivate them, and make sure they take root and flourish? In other words, how do we educate people and show them how to nurture slow food values in our daily lives? I feel very deeply that schools are the best place to, to make this happen. Education in the United States 
is our last truly democratic institution. Schools are the place where we can introduce and teach a new way of living and caring for the environment to a new generation. They're the commonplace in all cultures, I believe, where we can reach every student equally and rapidly while they're still young and open and learning before they've been indoctrinated by a fast food culture. Schools are, in my opinion, the places where we can create deep and lasting change. For the last 25 years, I've been working on building an alternative, an edible education curriculum for all of our schools. It's a curriculum that uses an interactive kitchen and garden classroom to teach slow food values as part of all of their academic subjects. We now have a network of 6,500 schools around the world. And the centerpiece, this is the most important, the centerpiece of this vision needs to be a new kind of cafeteria where students sit down together in the middle of every day and share a freshly cooked organic meal. This way, the schools stop giving money to the fast food culture and start buying organic food and supplies directly from the local farmers and ranchers. Now, I call this school-supported agriculture. It has all of the ideas of community-supported agriculture embedded in it. It can be a vital economic engine for the local economies. And it can be a real participant in a regenerative agriculture. Can you imagine if all the schools took their food scraps, well, if they didn't cook them for the school lunch, <laughs> and if they took them back to the farms. Wouldn't that be an amazing way to address climate change? Well, if this happens, the old poisonous food systems with their long-distance deliveries and packaging and additives and preservatives will wither and die. New, vibrant, self-reliant, sustainable food networks will be born. And this is what we've been doing in my restaurant, Chez Panisse, for 47 years now. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but it was always a great pleasure for me. I never, ever was work. When we met Bob Kennard, our farmer, um, we gave him seeds. Oops, it's not my apple this time. <laughs> my microphone. Uh, we gave him uh, seeds and we said, Bob, plant the seeds. And here we are many, many years later and he's telling us what to eat. He says, I have nettles. I have these wild nettles growing all over. Can you make something out of them? And so, one of the really successful dishes of Chez Benny's is a nettle pizza. And people order it specifically because they cannot imagine eating anything like that. It's all prickery and sticking out in the, in the fields. So what we've done is really cut out the middleman completely. Cut out the middleman. We may have, you know, 30, 40, 50 people that we buy food from during the course of the year. And one may have just one huge mulberry tree. 
and some of them provide us. Bob provides us with salad every, every day. And so it's, it's kind of amazing what could happen. Um, and I guess this is what, why, uh, why Alex and, and has named this, um, this speech, How to Rock the Food System, because this is the way. I'm telling you, this is the way. It's so unbelievably subversive. Nobody knows if you're buying, if you use that school money, you can buy directly. I know because we have experiments already happening all around San Francisco for the same minuscule budget that the United States government reimburses the schools. We can do this. We can do this because the farmers want to help us. They want to be paid the real cost of the food. And when you ask a farmer to sell to, to the grocery store, they have to sell it wholesale. And just imagine when the farmer gets the real cost of the food. So I call this a very delicious revolution. Thank you. <laughs> Hey! <laughs>